How are you guys? It's good to be together, a cool, crisp fall morning. It is great to be here this morning and uh, a reminder of how great our God is. As we think of all that he said in his word and what his word actually means to us, what it means to the rest of the world and the, and the hope that it brings. You know, that's really the reason that we are in the midst of this series that we call text. It's, my hope is that it drives us back into the Word of God, that teaches about us about who God is, that teaches us how to live in relationship with God and, and with each other, that really brings us hope. So with that, if you would, uh, join me in prayer. We'll, <clears throat> we'll dive in together. Heavenly Father, uh, God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a day, a new day. Thank you for the promises that come. Thank you that you carry us, God, uh, through the storm and through the calm. You are there. Thank you for the strength that you give us for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will that you will move among us, that you will quicken our hearts and our minds, that will experience you fresh today, God, maybe even for the very first time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, how many of you, how many of you would agree that people think you're crazy or they call you crazy when you attempt to do something or maybe you actually follow through and you actually do something that most people think is impossible. Anybody here ever been called crazy before for trying to do something? A few, a few of you have stepped out, right? Uh, for instance, uh, I, I, I've said this, um, you know, about people who jump out of airplanes with parachutes on. It's like, why would you ever jump out of a perfectly good airplane? That's crazy, well, well, think, think about this guy. How about, how about jumping out of an airplane at 25,000 feet without a parachute, without a, a, a wingsuit on? Well, that in fact happened. There's a guy by the name of Luke Akins who uh, earlier this summer jumped out of an airplane without a parachute, 25,000 feet above the air and jumped out. This was live TV. They filmed it. Uh, you, might, you might say that this guy is is crazy, right? And, and you might, in fact, be true. Uh, this guy's married. He's got a four-year-old son. But still he jumped. But, the, but there's another angle to this, and I want you to understand the angle that Aikens come from. See, he, he was clear that this stunt involved a ridiculous amount of training. I mean, for starters, the 42-year-old has over 18,000 jumps to his name. 18,000. And according to CNN, he prepared for the stunt by doing dozens of jumps, each naturally wearing a parachute, aiming at a 100-square-foot target, opening his chute at the last possible moment. In the practice jumps, he would wait till he was 1,000 feet above, and then he would, he would pull his chute and hit the target. And he consistently hit a much smaller target than the target he would use on that final jump, giving him some margin. Well, the day came, and he actually hit the target, a hundred by hundred square foot net. And you can you can watch it on YouTube. It's it's actually scary, even though you know he's going to hit it. Uh, it's 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 an incredible thing. But here here's what here's what he says. Whenever people attempt to push the limits of what's considered humanly possible, they're invariably described as crazy. I'm here to show you that if we approach it the right way, and if we test it, and we prove that it's good to go, that we can do things that we don't think are possible. So the guy might still be insane, he's just, just a little bit over the edge, but his logic makes sense. When you do the math, when you test things to their limit, when you seek to know and to understand, you can go places that you never thought were possible. And so today, I want to take you somewhere that you might have never thought 
possible. I, I want to walk you through the numbers. I want to put our Bible to the test. I want to authentically seek truth with you. Understanding that when we know the truth, the truth actually sets us free. See, one of the challenges, and I know this is a challenge because it comes out when we ask the question that we have with reading our Bible, is that some of us, we, we, we struggle with what's written because we don't actually believe the words on the page. I mean, it, it's a cute story. I mean, there's some, there's some help with it. But it isn't literal, and it certainly isn't helpful for navigating life in 2016. And so when I ask you guys to get serious about reading your Bibles, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I wish I could, but I'm not sure I really believe it. And if you don't believe that the words of the Bible are true, then how can it shape your life? How can it have an effect on you? And the truth is, it can't, and it doesn't. When the words of Scripture line up with our beliefs, well, then, then, then it's all good, right? When it, when it lines up with the beliefs of our culture, then we say, well, the, the Bible's good. But when the Bible contradicts our beliefs or, or popular opinion, then the Bible is useless at best. It's dangerous at its worst. The reality is that this is the way our world approaches Scripture and it affects how you and I live it out. But what if, what if we were able to prove with some certainty that the Bible is true? What, what if the words written on its pages were actually the words inspired by our God? How would that really affect us? If, that, if we knew that to be true, how would it affect us? And how do we go about proving that there is truth in Scripture? Well, like Aikens, we, we would do it methodically. We'd do it scientifically, and we'd do it with an open mind. And that's the way I want you to approach today. Let, let, let's talk about our Bible, right? Let, let's let's uh, start with the undisputed facts. First, the Bible is the number one best-selling book in all of history. It's a pretty big deal, but it isn't just one book. It's actually 66 different books, and within those 66 books... It contains 773,692 words. There's a lot to our Bible. It would take the average person about 70 hours to read the Bible out loud. It was written by all sorts of people, politicians and statement, statesmen. There were farmers, shepherds, peasants, musicians, poets, even tax collectors. The Bible was written from many different places. Moses wrote in the wilderness. Jeremiah wrote in a dungeon. Luke wrote while traveling. Paul wrote from a prison. John wrote while in exile on the island of Patmos. It was written from, three, from 13 different countries, from three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, and three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And here's what's truly amazing. Even though the Bible was written by people from all different kinds of walks of life over a span of over 1,500 years, the message, the message of Scripture about God's character, about His nature, about the redemptive plan that He has for all of humanity, it's incredibly consistent over all those authors, over all that time. And while maintaining a consistent message about God, it speaks to so many practical topics. I mean, everything from marriage, divorce, remarriage, adultery, sex, and lust, and greed, and guilt, and materialism, and generosity, healing, hope, forgiveness, parenting, prayer, friendship, pride, obedience, heaven, hell, lying, murder, suicide, rape, fears, doubts, miracles, love, hate, money, criticism, creation, government, submission, rebellion, peace, leadership. Should I go on? I will. Comparisons, joy, discontentment, sacrifice, delayed gratification, patience, faithfulness, enjoying life, self-control, uh, disasters and injustices and demons and angels and discipleship and disciplines and fasting and honor and mercy and caring for the poor, wealth, family, and even, even cats. But There's not actually cats in there, but they talk about the devil, so it's kind of the same thing. But I, th I think, 
I think we can all agree that the Bible is unique, and it's a valuable, a valuable book. So let, let's talk for a few minutes about the reliability of our Bible. I mean, is the Bible trustworthy? Is it accurate? Is it, is it true? Or is it just the opinions of a bunch of different people? Well, in 1952, there was a historian named Steve Sanders who came up with three specific tests to evaluate the authenticity of historical writings like the Bible. So let's, let's put the Bible to these three specific tests. All right, the first test is known as the internal test, the internal test. Regarding the Bible, the internal test wants to answer the question, do the authors of the Bible claim that their writings are true? I mean, in, in, in effect, uh, do the people who wrote the Bible say that it's just a story, I just kind of made it up, it's a good read, you know, it's kind of fiction, but you'll enjoy it, or do they say, uh, no, I, I was there, this is truth, this is authentic, this is real and accurate. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at them, and, and I hope you brought your Bibles, and I don't care if it's, if it's a virtual Bible or if it's the real deal, uh, but let's open up to, to the back of the New Testament, to the book of 2 Peter. We'll look at uh, chapter 1, verse 16. The author of this particular book, this letter, uh, was one of Jesus' closest followers, and here's, here's what he said. For we did not follow, we did not follow what? Cleverly devised stories. We didn't make it up. We didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were what? What does Peter say? We were eyewitnesses. We were, in, in other words, Peter's saying, I, I was there. I saw it. I experienced him firsthand. See, Peter's saying is, is that what I'm, what I'm telling you, what I'm writing is absolutely true. It's factual. I was there. And, and so let's you and I just do some math together, some reasoning together. When, when was the New Testament written? This is important for us to understand and to know. Most reputable scholars think it was written between 47 and 95 A.D., Essentially, during the lifetime of many who would have been witnesses and who would, or who would have heard the stories of Jesus, they were there. There were plenty of first-generation believers alive when Scripture was, when the New Testament was written. People who saw firsthand all that the Bible was talking about. And if it wasn't true they could have and likely would have refuted the writings of Peter, the writings of John, the writings of Matthew and of Paul and the, and the rest of the New Testament authors. They would have said, no, that's not true. But, but here's reality, and this is important for us to understand. They didn't refute the words of those authors. We have no credible, timely evidence that refutes these first century writings. None. Uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy. Let's look at another passage. This passage would also count as internal evidence. And just, uh, just to get the blood flowing, if, would you guys just stand? Let's read this together. Make sure you guys are still with me. We're going to look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Let's read this together, all right? One voice. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's God's word. Go ahead and, and be seated. All Scripture, this is, what, this is internal evidence. This is what the Bible says about itself. All Scripture is God-breathed. And this, this word God-breathed comes from the Greek word, Theopneustos. Theopneustos. If you're taking notes, it, it, it means divinely breathed, given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training. According to the authors, the authors of Scripture, the Bible is 
the inspired Word of God. And it will give you everything that you need to fulfill everything that God has called you to do. And so based on Steve Sanders' internal test, I mean, clearly across the board, everyone would say, yes, the Bible passes the internal test. It, set, it, it, it believes, the, the writers believe that it's true. But let's talk about another very important test. This one is called the external test. The external test seeks to answer the question, what does the outside evidence say about the Bible? In other words, what do non-biblical sources say about the Bible? Do they confirm the biblical stories? Or do they say that, well, those aren't true? Well, let, let's, let's start with Jesus. And, and we find through extra-biblical sources, b- sources outside of Scripture, that the, history, the historicity of Jesus is very well established. There might be some question about what he said or how he said it, but there is no debate over the person being alive. You can read non-biblical writings about Jesus from Roman authors, Greek authors, Jewish sources. These authors affirm the life of Jesus Christ. For instance, um, there's a first century historian, his name is Josephus. He wrote about Jesus. He wrote about John the Baptist. He wrote about James. He wrote about other leaders that we find in the book of Acts. And so we have these external sources that help validate Scripture. But, but what about archaeology? Archaeology hasn't always been the friend of the Bible. Actually, for, for many years, critics discredited the Bible because archaeological discoveries didn't support enough of Scripture. But then in the 20th century, all sorts of archaeological uh, finds were discovered. Many of these claims to discredit the Bible have now been reversed. And while we can't accurately say that archaeology completely proves the authority of the Bible... It's fair to say that archaeological evidence has provided external confirmations for literally hundreds of biblical statements. Over and over and over again, archaeological discoveries confirm the truth of what Scripture says. In fact, I love what Nelson Gluck says. He's the former president of the Jewish Theological Seminary, one of the greatest archaeologists of all time. He said this, that it may be stated categorically, that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. To put that in plain English, we have no archaeological evidence that denies the claims of the Bible and hundreds of archaeological finds that affirm what Scripture says. The Bible passes the external test with ease. The, the third of Sanders' test is called the bibliographic test. Kind of gives me flashbacks to high school and having to create that bibliography. The, bibli- the bibliographic test uh, tries to determine how accurately the original documents were translated and copied over time. It also c- considers the timely proximity between the oldest manuscripts and the proposed date of the original writings. So as we understand this, there's, there's one original and everything else is a copy. And the closer the date of the copies to the original and the number of those copies and the, the degree of accuracy between the original and the copies, well then, the higher the writing scores on a bibliographic test. So let's talk about uh, how many copies of the Old Testament were made. Well, during the rabbinic period... We know that scribes who copied the Old Testament were meticulous and they were reverent about this task. As a measure of quality control, they would would count up every letter of the Old Testament and they would find the middle letter. And then when a new transcript was completed, they would count all of the letters in that transcript and they would find the middle one. And if the middle one was off, then that whole transcript was thrown away without question. They tried to minimize mistakes. Now, we have very few ancient copies of the Old Testament, likely because they would either wear out or be ceremonially burned, buried, or destroyed if there were imperfections found. And because of this, for centuries, 
The most reliable and well-respected Hebrew manuscript that we have was called the Masoretic Text. And it was created sometime between the 7th and the 10th century current era, CE. Now, but, but here's an amazing part of this story, a relatively uh, new part of the story. In the year 70 AD, right, Jesus, this is just after uh, Jesus had died, rose again, now the early church is starting. The Romans were attacking Jewish people. They were trying to destroy their culture, uh, especially their religious heritage. And so the Jewish people, they took all their scrolls and they put them in clay vessels and then they hid them. Uh, they, they buried them. They, they put them in caves. And for 1,800 years, these historic writings were lost. Uh, they, we, we didn't know they even existed. They remained completely hidden. But in 1947, a Bedouin shepherd stumbled upon some of these old clay vessels. Inside, he found what became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeologists then went and discovered 11 other sources of these ancient scrolls. When you compare the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are at least a thousand years older than the Masoretic text, there are subtle differences, but the overall accuracy is, is stunning. It's an amazing thing. One of the ways to gain a high score on the bibliographic test is to have multiple copies with little deviation. So when there are a lot of old copies and they're very similar, you score high. Now to put this in, into context, and context is important, let's compare the Bible to some other historical writings. For example, in high school you may have read uh, the Odyssey or, or the Iliad by Homer. The Iliad is the most accepted non-biblical historical writing around. There were 643 copies ancient copies of the Iliad, the earliest of which dates about 500 years from the original. So, so the original was written, and 500 years later, there was a copy that we have. That's, that's a big deal in ancient history. That's why this, this book is generally accepted as accurate, as true. But there's other historical writings. Uh, Plato's Republic, for instance, we, for instance, we have seven copies of that Aristotle's writings, we have 49 ancient manuscripts. Caesar, we have 10 from him. So the most accepted non-biblical historical writing would unquestionably be Homer at 643. But what about the New Testament? Well, we, we don't have 643 copies of the New Testament. We have actually over 5,600 copies of the New Testament. And all of those copies were done within a hundred years of the original. It's astounding. There is such strong evidence for the accuracy of the Bible. When, when you compare the New Testament against any other historical writing, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Bible stands alone and unquestionably passes the bibliographic test with flying colors. And, and so, so think about this with me. And it's important that we actually walk through this. So we have, we have the internal test. We have the external test. We have the bibliographic test. And the Bible passes all of them. These are the standards, the gold standard. But let's examine one more piece of evidence. I mean, as, as, you, as you examine the Old Testament, you come upon numerous predictions. We call them prophecies that actually came true. It's another way of validating the Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, you'll find prophecies or predictions that would take place either in New Testament times or even centuries later in, in modern times. And people, people would say that this thing is going to happen, and then it, then it actually did. I'm going to go over just a, a, a few of those. But what I want to relay is, is the odds of these actually happening. The odds of these prophecies actually happening. In, in the, in the mid-1950s, there was a professor by the name of, of Peter Stoner. Good thing he, went, he retired before the 60s. That would have been bad. He, he was the chairman of the science division at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. Professor Stoner wrote a book called Science Speaks, in which he breaks down the likelihood of some of these prophecies being fulfilled. For example, it was prophesied that Jesus would, would be born in Bethlehem. 
And, and so about the time of Jesus' birth, they found out what the population of the world was, and they, would, they, they determined the odds of someone being born in Bethlehem, and they put a number on it. Well, so, Stoner did that with eight specific prophecies about Jesus. And then he turned in all these numbers to a group within the American Scientific Affiliation, a kind of governing board of statistics. And they all gave their thumbs up, and they said, this is all accurate, and it's done well. It's acceptable. So they took eight of these prophecies, and they, turned, they determined the odds of these eight specific things happening to one individual. And the odds, as they added all these up, were just one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a super big number. That's 100 quadrillion. I'm not even sure that's a real number, but that's, that's the number right there. That's the number. So to give you a visual of what this would be like, I mean, to actually fulfill these, it's like taking one silver dollar and putting a big X on that silver dollar and then dropping it somewhere, anywhere, anywhere in the state of Texas. I mean, it could be Austin or Lubbock or Dallas or Houston or San Antonio or El Paso. You could put it in a field or on a highway or in a river. And then on top of that one silver dollar, you would pour two feet of silver dollars over the whole state of Texas. So over the whole state of Texas, there's, there's one coin that you need to find in two feet of silver dollars covering the whole state. And then you blindfold, you blindfold a guy and you say, okay, you can go out and find it. And walk around. And when you, when you get the feeling that it's right, you just bend over and you pick it up, and that's the silver dollar. Well, the chances of finding that right coin would be about the same as these eight prophecies being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Those are astronomical odds, unthinkable odds. I mean, it takes greater faith. Think about this logically with me. It takes greater faith to believe in chance than it does to believe that God inspired the words written in the book that we call the Bible. See, when you, when you actually put the Bible to the test, I mean really scrutinize its historicity, not just listen to what the world says about it, but actually think about it on your own, it unquestionably passes the test. The Bible is proved true. The greater question for each of us is are we willing to humble ourselves? You and me, are we willing to humble ourselves? To put ourselves under the protection and the authority of God, to receive His grace and to follow after Him? Or do you really think you're God? I mean, able to determine right from wrong, not only for yourself, but for all those who come after you. Friends, we, we serve the creator of the universe. Our Father in heaven has given us his word, the Bible, that we might know him, that we might love him, that we might live for him all of the days that have been given by him. The Bible is proved true. Don't, don't take my word for it. Put it to the test yourself. Put it to the test. But let me warn you that ignorance is no excuse. God's not hiding. Your busy lifestyle does not suffice as a reason for not knowing Him. Pick up His Word daily and find life in our God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, I've often thought that if I, if I could have the people of the quarry do one thing, one thing that would, that would go the farthest to transform our world, go the farthest to complete the mission that, that God has given us. Do you, do, you know, do you know what my answer would be for you? What would it be to have all you grow in, in generosity? Right? So, so that we'd use our resources to give to people who are in need. Would it be that all you would, would become more, more mission-minded and you'd go out into all the world and you'd tell people about Jesus? Would it, would it be that you would become incredibly prayerful people 
That you'd pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would it be that you would be godly? Right? Righteous people. And people would see that righteousness and they would be compelled to follow God. Would it be that you would be so full of joy that when you walk in a room, you know, the, the aroma of Christ w- w- would emanate from you and people would be hungry to have what you have? Would it be that you'd be incredible parents, that you'd raise up the next generation, that they might come to know God? Well, if there's one thing, if there's one thing I could do. It wouldn't be any of those things. Now, I recognize I don't, I don't have the power to do that, but I can dream. And if I could have you do just one thing, it would be to daily read God's Word. And, and not just read it, but meditate on it and do what it says. Because if you do that, I mean, if you would if you'd read God's Word, meditate on God's Word, follow God's Word, then I believe that all the other things that we just talked about would actually happen as well. You'd be, you'd be godly parents. You'd be godly in all your ways. You'd be righteous people. You'd be full of the joy of God. You would be a generous people, not holding on to the worthless material things of this world. You'd be a prayerful people. You'd be a mission-minded people. You'd be a God-honoring people. And by the power of God, I believe you'd change the world. So let's be that people. Friends, listen once again to what the Bible says about itself. It says that all Scripture is God-breathed. It originates from God. It's useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. And now listen to what the Bible says about you. That if you're in Christ... The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The Bible has proved true. Read it. Live it. Share it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God's a lot of information. But Lord, we a lot of us have just listened to the world about, you know, we, we can't really believe this archaic book and you know, it was true, it was relevant a long time ago, but it's not relevant to us. And, and so we're just being battered. We're just being carried along in this storm of life. But God, you have given us an anchor, a mooring that we can tie off to. Your word is true. We can live by it. It's, it's not easy to live by it. But you give us the strength and the power You give us the patience and the perseverance. You give us the hope to follow you. So God, I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will reveal your truth to us. That you open your word to us, God. That we might be people of your word for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to continue on in worship this morning by taking communion together. So I'm going to just talk about why.